Hello, everyone, and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum and networking platform at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. SALT Talks are a digital interview series that we started during this work from home period with leading investors, creators, and thinkers. And what we're trying to do on SALT Talks is replicate the experience that we provide at our global conferences, the SALT Conference, which we host twice annually, one in the United States and one internationally, most recently uh, in Abu Dhabi in 2019. And what we're trying to do at those conferences and on these talks is provide a window into the mind of subject matter experts, as well as provide a platform for what we think are big ideas that are shaping the future. And we're very excited today to welcome Jordan Gaspar and Jordana Keir to Salt Talks. Uh, Jordan Gaspar is the managing partner of AF Ventures, which is a venture capital firm investing in high growth consumer product companies. Launched in 2014, AF Ventures manages 35 plus portfolio brands across a wide array of consumer brands in food and beverage, beauty and personal care, health and wellness, and pets. And hopefully we don't have any pets uh, interrupting our broadcast here today, but if they do, uh, we'll embrace it and keep rolling. Uh, prior to founding AF Ventures, Jordan was an attorney at Morrison Cohen LLP, where she advised venture and private equity firms and their portfolio companies on acquisitions, sales, mergers, and financings. Uh, Jordan graduated from Columbia College and received her JD from Fordham Law School in New York. Uh, Jordana Keir is the co-founder of Lola, which is the first lifelong brand for her body. Before co-founding Lola, Jordana received her MBA from Columbia Business School, during which she worked at Rent the, the Runway and Quidzy, not to be confused with Quibi, uh, which is the media company that failed miserably. Uh, she graduated from Dartmouth College in 2008 and was named to Forbes 30 Under 30 in 2016 and Crane's 40 Under 40 in 2019. Jordana also serves on the Dartmouth Entrepreneurial Network Advisory Board. Just a reminder, if you have any questions during today's talk for Jordan or Jordana, you can enter them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your video screen on Zoom. And now I'm going to turn it over to Jordan to host the interview. Thank you, John. Really appreciate you and Salt having us today and looking forward to Great speaking to with you. everyone. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so hi, everybody. I, excuse me in advance if I have any kids kind of bump into the picture. We'll do our best in this sort of new medium. Um, I'm Jordan Gaspar, Managing Partner of AF Ventures. And as John explained, we're a venture fund that invests in high growth consumer brands. Um, we see ourselves as having a unique model in that we offer a proprietary set of resources and a real hands-on approach to working with our teams uh, across you know, a domain experience in financial construction, marketing techniques, um, distribution, and supply chain. And you know, within that, we, unlike you know, typical venture funds where you know, it's a wide model, um, we do have a wide portfolio, but it does involve taking an active approach you know, to, to offer change and help support our founders um, and advocate for them in particular in ways such as this. With over a you know hundred and million under management, um, we've got you know over thirty five brands in the portfolio that really do span um, primarily food and beverage, which was our bread and butter, no pun intended. Um, and of the thirty nine active portfolio companies, thirty six of them are food and beverage. But we recently expanded, in, you know, right before COVID in February into the new verticals of personal care, pet beauty, and wellness. Um, and we are super excited because you know Jordana and Lola are pilot investment in personal care. Um, so, you know, with that, I'll have Jordana introduce herself um, and tell you a little bit about Lola, which we're really excited to support. Thank you, Jordan. And thank you, John and Salt, for having us here. Um, it's wonderful to, uh, to, to share our stories. Um, as Jordan mentioned, and John too, uh, Lola is the first lifelong brand for a woman's body for reproductive health. Um, our aim is to provide the transparent products, the transparent content, and a supportive community um, that we think women deserve uh, for their entire reproductive life cycle. Um, you know, initially when we launched the business, it was really about changing the way women thought about, purchased, and received their, and also talked about uh, their feminine care products. And so the first three years of the business, it was really about reinventing that experience. Um, 
finding a lot of opportunity to improve this very reactive, very vulnerable journey that many women go through on a monthly basis. Um, and that led us to eventually developing our own IP, building our own manufacturing machine, developing our own content conversation, um, as well as a platform for women to really engage and feel very informed as they uh, go through their reproductive journeys. Um, we we then set up, set our sights on category expansion into sexual wellness to continue to deliver this very holistic approach to the resources that we believe women deserve for their reproductive journey. So um, obviously products, but also expert advice, um, and eventually also expanded into brick and mortar retail with our launch into Walmart uh, full chain in March of this year. And so sort of tapping into that, um, the, the, the offerings that we provide, also making sure that this omni-channel access is something that she knows she can rely on Lola for. Um, you know, our, our mission and vision is really just to build a brand that makes women's health a lot less lonely and a lot less confusing. Um, and, you know, we just continue to plan to expand our product portfolio, um, both physical and digital, um, you know, with, with women's needs in mind, um, made by women, um, and ensuring that, again, these products are available however she wants to shop. Uh, so whether that's online, whether that's on shelf, um, especially in this moment in time when a lot of our purchasing behaviors are changing by the day. Um, and really also in addition to that, and we'll, I think we'll get into this a little later, but um, wanting to make sure that we are sparking a conversation that drives also policy change um, and really systemic change to ensure that we are improving women's lives for the better. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, you know, it's as longstanding investors in food and beverage, we see COVID as a big marker of change in the consumer landscape across the board. You know, and, and I'd say that we've seen, you know, the the common you know notion that we've been investing in that food is health, um, where you invest, where we were investing in functional products, functional beverages, grain-free foods, um, you know, stress natural stress relievers like adaptogens. You know, that's really evolved into more broadly products as health. And so, you know, with a blurring of the categories between food and personal care and beauty, you know, and the emergence of categories like ingestible beauty for the first time, you know, there really is almost this convergence of multiple categories that used to operate in their silos, you know, that are really focused on general well-being um, and people, you know, taking care of their bodies from within. And so I'd love if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about your perspective on how the natural personal care space is evolving um, and the rapid category growth that's been go undergoing in the past couple of years, but even particularly this past year. Yeah, I mean, it, when even when we started the business, I mean, in 2015, we, you know, myself, my co-founder, we never thought about feminine care, personal care as part of an overall wellness routine, right? You think of wellness, you think of beauty, you think of um, pampering, right? But there's also these, these categories, food, uh, personal care that, um, that are sort of almost the foundations upon which we build great habits and good hygiene. And yet, you know, it, these are things that are typically um, or historically have been very reactive categories. And, you know, when you think about the fact that a woman uses over 11,000 tampons in her lifetime, but the FDA doesn't require companies to provide a comprehensive, comprehensive list of ingredients on the back of the box, um, you know, and then sort of layered on top of that, the historical stigma around these topics in general and how they're not really spoken about, um, you know, that that gave us an enormous opportunity to to drive our conversation and to marry um, the this, these categories with proactive wellness care. Um, because I mean, even for myself, it felt kind of almost like an awakening where I was like, why aren't I thinking about these things? I know I'm going to get my period every month. Um, I know I'm going to need these products. Um, I've been relying on, you know, my, my historical knowledge or my mom, my sister, my older cousin who I trust. Um, and so I just use what is put in front of me um, because, at a, you know, as a 12, 13 year old girl, you're very impressionable and it's a vulnerable moment, um, you know, to step back from that and say, wait a minute, we actually 
think it's important to know what we're putting in and around our bodies, particularly in this category. Um, you know, that was a really important moment for us and for every one of our customers. Um, you know, the way we see it, there's really three main issues in, in our space is one, this lack of consumer awareness. It's a lack of incentive uh, by brands to be fully transparent. Um, and then a lack of public support to study these categories and keep companies accountable. I mean, when you're talking about products that a woman may use for up to 40 years of her life, um, why aren't there long-term studies about the different ingredients that might go into these products? And so, you know, luckily, and, and especially in this year, all the trends are, you know, pointing to, to a, a really positive change um, in all of these, these, these three issues that we've identified. And, um, you know, we're seeing that in the naturals category, it's significantly outpacing synthetics um, in the feminine care space um, and significantly out facing the options. Um, so you have kind of both um, a real a real growth of merging brands, which is which is wonderful. It you know, drives a, a broader conversation um, and helps to validate you know, our hypothesis back in 2015. Um, but then you also have the actual interest from consumers um, really putting their money where their mouth is. And so um, you know, we're just super excited and, and thrilled that you know, the conversation is really changing um, at all angles, you know, whether it's it's consumer behavior or it's policy um, or even just the the way that big businesses are are thinking about changing their models. Um, you know, it, when we launched in Walmart in March, we have, you know, over time done a lot of really wonderful surveys to understand the changing in behaviors, particularly in this year when, um, when all of our lives have sort of been thrown upside down. And um, a really interesting nugget is that 29% of Walmart feminine care shoppers told us that they're more likely to use natural feminine care products than they were pre-COVID. And 51% of women wish retailers would offer a better selection of natural feminine care. And so, you know, we're not just seeing this in, again, the, you know, the, the new brands that are coming on the coming uh, online, but also the fact that purchasers and shoppers are actively looking for a change in this category. We couldn't agree more, you know, and I think that COVID itself is going to be, you know, a big marker for what the consumer's expectations are going to be of the brands that they start to consume, you know, so, you know, when we look at, you know, scaling consumer brands, we've always said, you know, that, that part of the, the rise of them is about money manufacturing and manpower. And, you know, through COVID, I'd say that that has definitely been um, exacerbated by what are supply chain challenges and financial challenges. And so, you know, we see a post COVID world that really does prioritize first and foremost supply chain, right? You know, it's been something that the consumers become extremely aware of is where are the products coming from? How do they get to my door? What are they made of? Um, and, you know, sort of this widespread technology adoption is going to be something that really does improve our industry. But beyond that, I think a lot of consumers are now becoming even more, you know, open-minded to sustainable practices because you think about how much garbage we're all consuming in our homes that we weren't as aware of before. And so sustainability, transparency, you know, these are things that people are now living with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and then obviously, you know, making sure that there's, you know, just basic organization on the supply chain. You know, I think that, you know, the consumer is, has become aware that a supply chain does exist that brings their products to their home. Um, you know, for from a venture perspective, we did see a shift in the space through COVID in terms of the financial construction of growth stage companies. Um, and whereas there were certainly a lot of unprofitable businesses going into COVID, COVID definitely uh, raised the awareness of founders in our space of profitability and how important it was to be self-sustaining and not rely on capital markets and not expect that there's going to be the next raise ahead of them. And so, you know, early on in COVID, I'd say almost our entire portfolio, you know, recut their budgets in March and April and really thought through what is, you know, what are our unit economics? How can we optimize our partnerships, our supply relationships, but how also can we build a more scalable, profitable business? And so we've been saying, you know, that for the past eight, nine months that we're going to see a lot more profitable businesses come through COVID. And I think that that's certainly come to fruition. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, look, 
Bill is also a perfect example of what is now an increasing prioritization of the omni-channel distribution strategy. And you know, as historical food and beverage investors, um, I'd say that you know we've seen that um, D 2 C, you know, and, and sort of digitally native brands were something that was really difficult and challenging for refrigerated and frozen foods um, and something that would probably be much easier in the personal care space, you know, but it's now all of a sudden the food and beverage space has realized that it's really important to be omni and to offer an ability for consumers to be able to acquire products at their doorstep. And so a lot of the concepts that the digitally native brands have thinking through their super fans and marketing, you know, sort of online and through social media channels are something that a lot of food businesses are rethinking and vice versa a lot of digitally native brands like Lola have now had the ability to launch into brick and mortar retail. And so there's a convergence really of the construction of a lot of consumer companies. So I'd love to hear a little bit, if you wouldn't mind telling us about your D2C business. And then of course, our, you know, the amazing expansion into Walmart this year. I think for us, I mean, D2C um, can be such an important channel for a brand to build and grow a business, but we see D2C as a channel. It's not a business. Um, it is one way that you can reach your customers. And it's, for us, it's been a, a vital, a vital channel because, you know, we've been able to allow her to feel seen and heard, um, particularly in these categories, because reproductive care can be such an isolating and vulnerable journey. Um, and allowing women the opportunity to connect with a brand directly and share what they're thinking, what they're feeling, um, what they find is what they think is missing in these categories. Um, that's new. That's empowering in a way that, you know, we haven't seen historically in this category. And, um, but again, it's a channel, it's not a business. Um, and that's where I think, you know, this sort of cutting out the middleman type of approach and just sort of having that be um, the foundation upon which your business is built. Um, that's a harder message, I think, to uh, continue to, to have. Uh, it's a harder message to have staying power um, as you expand into new channels, um, because, you know, as a, what we want to do, what we want to build is a household brand. Um, and if we want to be there for her every step of the way, however she needs us, we can't just be available in one place. Um, we have to be available in, you know, in, in, in any place she wants to shop. And so, um, you know, it's definitely been exciting to see this wave of brands really challenging the old guard and, and bringing new innovative products and services to light to market. Um, but I think some will be grappling with the challenges of building a brand that can last for the next 50 to 100 years. Um, you know, we, we feel very confident that um, by starting with D2C and by enabling that one-to-one -one connection and that and building that trust and authenticity, that just gives us a real leg up on some of these big incumbents who, you know, say um, they, they, may, they may know exactly what women, women want, um, but I think when you actually are connecting and, and having these very intimate one-to-one -one conversations, whether it's through email, whether it's through phone, whether it's through direct messages on social platforms, um, you know, that's really how you get to the crux of what it is that's missing in these categories, whether it's product, whether it's, whether it's experience. Um, you know, I think... COVID obviously has changed a lot of the way that we've thought, we've, we thought about our business and building it. Um, certainly, you know, thinking a lot more about, um, you know, growth in, in the right ways and, and really being prudent about that. Um, as a basically subscription business, because your period is basically the one thing you can't cancel every month. Um, you know, we we're in a fairly inelastic category. So like, we're not one that would see a real major impact as a result of the pandemic. Um, we're high growth, we're healthy um, in this environment, and frankly, in any environment, because we're providing customers with a with a long term solution in a product category where they previously just didn't have that option. And I think, you know, that goes for so many of your portfolio companies as well, where, you know, people aren't necessarily making a temporal change. Um, because they're home, they're making these structural changes to their lives and what they want to consume. Um, because they're they're sort of more awakened to the the elements around them. Um, 
you know, obviously our customers' routines have dramatically shifted. Um, so our focus has really been on maintaining that high touch customer experience and adapting to needs in real time. So whether that's flexibility around shipping, whether that's also partnering with Walmart um, to drive more digital resources. Um, you know, if they're shopping in the aisle, we have QR codes in our fixtures in our in, in the aisle um, where you can actually, you know, obviously be interacting with the product in the store, but also then get access to content on your phone. Um, you know, we're pivoting a lot of our community engagement strategy to be fully digital, um, including hosting a weekly period support group at home, um, and then providing also a lot of really wonderful digital resources resources via our online hub, The Spot. Um, and we've also introduced the Lola Collective, which is a new hub for women's health and really bringing together a forward-thinking group of trusted reproductive health experts, advocates, educators, um, really making sure that people can find answers even easier than ever. I think, you know, we we all, I think, are in this moment in time where, um, you know, the casual conversations that you may have in passing, whether with a friend, whether at the office, um, that's lacking now. And so, um, you know, those moments where it might be an opportune time to ask um, or share a personal, a personal story, um, are, it's harder now. It's, it's more difficult. And so we are living more isolating, more vulnerable lives. And, um, you know, again, reproductive health is already an isolating or can already be an, an isolating journey. Um, and so our mission is to, you know, continue to build on what we had been building pre-COVID to ensure that she just continues to feel really supported. Um, as I mentioned, this March, we launched full chain with Walmart, which was just really thrilling. I mean, we had been working on the launch for um, over a year at, at that point um, and just have, have felt so supported and thrilled um, who really to, to find a retail partner who really shares in our mission and, you know, making periods better through trusted products, through reliable resources, um, with a really convenient and innovative shopping experience. I mean, when you think about kind of the footprint of Walmart, um, maybe feminine care doesn't come to mind. The first thing, it's not the first thing that comes to mind, um, you know, but the, the fact is that the majority of U.S. women shop at Walmart and half of whom are shopping exclusively for their feminine care products at the retailer. And so, you know, that was really such an important uh, data point for us because, you know, if we want to be driving transparent products, candid content, um, and also omni-channel access, um, you know, what better initial retailer partner, um, you know, to, to, to launch with to really ensure that, especially in this moment in time, um, we're there for her when she needs us. Um, I also think, you know, there's, it's important to, to look back at our D2C heritage and say, you know, there really is value in, in that channel and there's insight that we can bring to the chat, bring to the retailer. And that is something that Walmart has been um, so wonderful in terms of um, just being receptive to hearing us out and, and hearing the types of insights that we have on her behavior in these categories. So um, a really exciting data point that we brought to them was 72% of our customers on our D2C channel um, don't just buy a single absorbency of product. And there's really no common, there's like a, not a most common pack. In fact, most women are kind of going off of the default on our site. And so, you know, we really worked with them to come up with an innovative solution um, to ensure that, you know, what we brought to the shelf still had some of that customization, that convenience magic um, and we were the first brand to cross merchandise tampons, pads, and liners, which, you know, with a, with a, Walmart, a partner like Walmart is really no small feat when it comes to execution. Um, and, you know, as we look ahead too, we're, you know, obviously prioritizing multiple shopping channels, being very, uh, being very, uh, 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 What's the word? Sorry. Um, really making sure that we're looking into the data and understanding how her shopping behaviors are changing, um, what she's looking for on the shelf. So, you know, whether that's through our collaboration with Walmart, whether that's through maintaining and innovating on our D2C channel, um, among others, you know, we just want to continue to drive better solutions um, across the entire reproductive health category. Um, we did actually also launch family planning, which is what Walmart calls their sexual um, and intimate wellness 
business um, in September. So it's been kind of a, an incredible year for us um, as far as, you know, really starting to solidify our presence on the shelf in not just one, but now two categories. Um, and really through our omni-channel approach, the goal is again, just to provide customers with that accessibility. So they're never caught unprepared. We're here, we're there for her wherever she is, again, regardless of the channel. Um, and we're just really, you know, we're really laser focused on um, making sure that, especially in this moment in time too, where, um, where again, shopping behaviors are changing, we're showing up where she needs us and where she's most comfortable. It's been an unbelievable year watching not one, but two line extension launches for you guys. And so congratulations on that. You know, I think that it's important for people to also understand how unprecedented this past year was in terms of for founders to even navigate this climate. You know, we ourselves are, you know, we joke we're a startup fund for startups. And so we launched our business in January 2014 and really grew from what was a $4 million fund into where we are now. And I look at you know, this past eight or nine months. And, you know, we felt, you know, a, a lot of conviction around getting back to our own roots with our COVID response. And so, you know, in this, in this period of time, launching into retail is in itself always channel, challenging on the scale that you did, but to do it during the surge is something that people have to really give you guys credit for. Um, and to give everyone context for that, you know, back in March, you know, the retailers, as you guys all remember from a consumer perspective, got wiped out all the products got pulled off the shelves. And so all of these businesses that have come into the market had to very quickly adapt. And so if you look at, you know, we always want to invest in founders who are resilient and resourceful and relentless. We also now want them to be adaptive and nimble and be able to make very strong executional changes very quickly. And that's something that, you know, was a big part of a hallmark of sort of launching in Walmart is how did Lola have to quickly pivot you know, and respond to what was, you know, basically a complete overhaul of how consumers were shopping and all the expectations they had going in. So you guys did an amazing job with that. Um, you know, for us, you know, we had the privilege of seeing, you know, 39 companies navigate that. And that's been an amazing thing, you know, to see all the founders across categories, different verticals, different areas of consumer space, some that are digitally native, some that are in brick and mortar, um, almost all nationwide, right, for the exception of the ones that are just, you know, sort of D to C. And what we did during COVID was starting in early March, we started having programming where every day we would have town halls, you know, across the different areas that we could support our brands, you know, and if you think about things like, obviously, you know, I've spoken about the supply chain, but also um, what's happening real time at Walmart, you know, um, can we get the distributors in our space to host a seminar, um, you know, having prominent redistributors, you know, kind of host a, you know, a seminar on logistics challenges and how to navigate, um, you know, working with organizations like Tag Logistics or with Dot Foods, you know, beyond that, you know, the founders in our portfolio all had such an amazing community and that they got to work together. And so on these daily town halls, we'd have over 30 of our founders sharing notes and, you know, swapping ideas and discussing, you know, very real-time distribution challenges and opportunities. And so one thing that, you know, we did encourage our brands to do is to work with the retail buyers in the way that Lola does and to say, hey, you have product that just got wiped off your shelf. Well, we have plenty of inventory for you. You know, please come to us as a first opportunity when you're thinking about how to fill your shelf space. And there really was an amazing amount of distribution that came out of, you know, kind of generating that conviction and confidence from the buyers that, you know, a brand was able to deliver and, you know, to deliver on 4,600 Walmart stores during a pandemic as a launch was pretty impressive. Um, so a big credit to the team and all the work they did. You know, I think that, you know, beyond that, you know, there were a couple of other things that during COVID, you know, people have, have spoken a lot about, but that behind the scenes, we were all working very, very closely, you know, how to navigate PPP, you know, and, and, and that's obviously something that, you know, the, there's been a lot of emphasis on with, you know, the, with everybody, but in, in the you know, sort of venture community in particular. And then, you know, we've started to really see on the other side of kind of what is now eight or nine sustained months of people working for home. What is the EQ side of this? How can we support our teams differently than what we used to? And so if the boardrooms were historically primarily going through the numbers, going through the manufacturing, going through marketing opportunities, we're actually starting to spend a lot of time with the boards that we work with our companies, you know, talking to our founders about how can we support our entrepreneurs and how can they support their teams? 
you know, and, and it's not just about products as wellness, but it's also about taking care of the people who are building the companies. And so I think it's become a very comfortable place that a lot of natural products companies are starting to feel very comfortable saying, you know, what are the practices we're going to do to support our team during this time? What are the conversations we're going to have? You know, and, and how is it that we can be mindful of being a good employer? Because I think that coming out of this beyond just the, the products that we're ingesting and putting in our, in our bodies is going to be a focus on you know, people as a whole and thinking through how can we be more human? How can we have more intention? How can we be thinking not just about you know, sort of business fundamentals, but that if we have teams that are operating and working well together, how we can support them you know, to grow and ultimately become you know, better quality businesses to invest in. And so I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about you know, kind of being, you know, we're, we're a woman-owned fund, so you know, we share that. You know, and, and I think that obviously as a woman-owned uh, company, a woman-run company, there's you know, sort of specific challenges. I think that Lola has such a unique culture in terms of how you um, encourage your team and how you work with your team, but even how you think about family planning and things like that. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about kind of how you guys uh, view building your internal community. Yeah, it's just a question. And um, I mean, when, when we started the business and through today, I mean, it, it's, it continues to be an incredibly mission driven organization. And so, um, when you have a year like we've had, um, you know, that, that doesn't, that, that commitment to that mission doesn't waver, but I think it's just so much more important to reinforce. And, um, particularly too, when you're not in the office, when you're not sort of having those casual conversations again, and sort of, um, consistently reinforcing kind of why we're all here and what we're all doing and, and why it's important to continue to work incredibly hard. Um, that, you know, you lose some of that when you're home, um, you know, all, and all, and all separated. Um, you know, I think my co-founder Alex and I have, have both now, you know, gone through our own reproductive journeys, had kids, et cetera. And so, you know, I think sort of to set that example as two founders and, um, you know, really sort of having, having women at the forefront of companies and, um, and having them be the decision makers that address our reproductive and sexual health, um, you know, leading the product innovation for such incredibly personal and intimate products. Like, um, that is something that I think, you know, we were very proud of in terms of um, infusing our own, you know, our own stories, our own happy stories, painful stories, um, you know, just ensuring that, you know, our customers and our team see us as openly and authentically as, you know, as, as we see ourselves as sort of just two women um, who, have, who found a problem that they wanted to solve. Um, you know, we both shared our own period, first period stories with the world, it seems, um, to spark a very candid dialogue. Um, you know, I think it's, it's just, uh, it starts from the top and then it sort of goes through the entire organization. And, um, you know, it's, it's infused in our values in terms of speaking up and showing up and, um, you know, being the voice for, um, for ourselves, for our company, for our peers, um, for our, for our customers and, um, you know, really never kind of settling on an answer that doesn't get to the root of a problem. Um, and I think that goes for both the subject matters that we work with, um, and work on and work to improve, um, as well as just like how we operate our business on a daily basis. Um, you know, I think, Raising money has obviously been a really interesting um, journey for us. Uh, you know, I think it's mostly been, you know, pitching to, to male investors. And I think that really opened our eyes to this information gap that truly does exist around women's reproductive health. Um, we found ourselves kind of walking male investors through, like, I think it was called like a vaginas 101, like slide <laughs> of just like, you know, you get your period and then you thinking about, you're thinking about becoming sexually active and like, maybe you're running to the drugstore and you don't really know what you need and, um, or you're embarrassed and you text your partner because they're going to be on their way home and, you know, and, and you need what you need something that they can pick up. And what is that conversation like? And, um, just they don't of, know where to buy tampons. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I like that. 
consumers. Um, <laughs> where, where are consumers even buying these products? <laughs> exactly. um, but I think it really started with telling kind of that whole story um, and doing it in a way that also, you know, invited conversation. Again, like our brand has never been about scare, being scare tactic or sort of pointing fingers and saying, you know, you're putting poison in your body because that, that, you know, that doesn't drive a productive and positive relationship. And that's one, that's something that we want to have with each, each of our customers, each of our teammates, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, really shaping that story um, and also finding opportunities too to like, you know, where are there analogies where men could, understand, you know, sort of what, what using a tampon, you know, might, might translate for them. So like food is actually a really great analogy that we consistently used um, to tell the story and, um, and really present ourselves as domain experts. And, you know, we were so encouraged to find that, you know, a, a real diverse group of investors were extremely receptive to the business, to the opportunity at hand. Um, you know, they understood the market potential. They understood the need for greater transparency because, you know, whether they had, they, whether they were close with their sister growing up, whether they had a daughter um, or whether, you know, the food and algae and story stuck with them, um, you know, that, that it really just took kind of every single approach um, to ensure that, you know, the, the story could really resonate. And, you know, we're just very proud to have a group of people around us who actively want to play a role in destigmatizing these aspects of reproductive health and educating women, educating men, having those open conversations um, and all the things we don't openly talk about because, um, you know, it's not... These are not topics that should be only talked about with one subset of a population. Um, you know, that's not where we will get to the root of driving change. Um, you know, I think uh, there has been a, um, uh, a real sort of expose, exposing of kind of taking a step back and saying like, you know, how are, how are women, how are women's topics and how are women sort of playing a role in the purchasing decisions for their household? And are those brands actually speaking to, to that consumer? And, you know, I think globally to see that women, um, you know, are making up 80% of purchasing, de purchasing decisions in the household, um, you know, so and like trillions of dollars, trillions of dollars, right? Like, Last I saw, it was like somewhere almost in $32 trillion in consumer spending per year, right? And the idea that it may not be women either behind those brands or helping to shape the strategy of those brands or helping to fund those brands, um, you know, that's a real opportunity um, to ensure that we are, that, that when I go into a store or when somebody else goes into a store, like I'm looking at a shelf and I'm feeling like I'm being heard. Um, you know, I think... Uh, there's, there's really, again, like this again, goes back like, to our D to C roots. Like, I think because we were able to foster this really candid conversation with a grassroots community and really sourcing that honest feedback from customers, sourcing honest feedback from our team about the pain points that they experienced in the category, um, infusing our own personal stories. Um, you know, it really helps to deliver on that competitive advantage, um, and delivering that product improvement, that innovation that we want, that customers want, um, and really also offering that peace of mind too, with sort of ensuring that we'll always be transparent with ingredients. Um, we're always going to make sure we're kind of going above and beyond in terms of quality testing. Um, you know, not just saying like our in-house people did it, but actually like putting it to the test with third parties. Um, you know, it's not, it's not cheap, but it's really important that we do that. And we go the extra mile and we put the ingredients on our box um, because we know that as our own consumers, we would expect the same thing. Um, so that has really been, I think a really proud moment for us um, to just continue to, to, to know that the way that we developed our brand and our and our ethos five years ago still remains really strong um, and and really resonant with our growing community. Um, I think specifically too with COVID, like you know, making sure that you know we continue to provide access 
uh, to resources and support across our digital platforms, support in store um, remains more crucial than ever. Um, you know, over half of women surveyed by us said they turned to Google first to find answers to their questions, but only 4% felt supported and only 8% felt informed when reflecting on their menstrual cycle. And so, you know, to me, it's, it's, where, where can we play a role and continue to play a role and really step in as that expert, as that ally, as she's going through her whole journey um, at whatever point she might be in, right? Whether, whether it's um, a young girl, like figuring out kind of what's happening to her body, which, you know, we, we developed a first period kit, which we're very proud of, or um, a sexual you, wellness kit. Because- you guys gave us the opportunity in our house to talk about periods for the first time, exactly. right? And so, so I, I say all the time, you know, and I've said this to you that, you know, being a venture investor, one of the things that I really do love is, uh, you know, as a working mother and you're one as well, you know, we um, unfortunately travel a lot or we did before the pandemic and you, know, you don't always get to have this sort of direct experience that you want to, you know, in terms of just, it, it's harder, you know, it's a balancing act, you know, that we all are doing. And you know, so for me, investing in, in um, young brands gives me the opportunity to talk about things in my home that I normally wouldn't. And so I, you know, I joke that we invested in a sustainable water business. And so it gave my household many, many months to talk about sustainability and packaging. And so with you, you know, I don't know if you remember, but um, it was the first time that I actually had conversations with my daughter about her period. And I really thought and relived the experience of, you know, when we were young, you, you, your whole education came through your mother or through books. And then, you know, you became a consumer of a brand of Tampax or tampons, I should say, or, or, um, or sanitary napkins because somebody handed you the box and you became a lifelong consumer. And so you were really the first person who encouraged and taught me about how you can build community and really evolve the conversation. And so I've been so impressed with how you guys have done that more broadly. And, you know, I'm sure during COVID in a time when access to information has been really challenged, you know, your community has definitely benefited from all of those, I'd say, educational resources that you guys really had instilled in the brand from day one. I think, thank you. I, 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 you know, I think when we first started the brand, um, you know, we did a lot of focus groups and, um, the first five minutes, I'm, I've told you this story probably millions of times, but like, you know, the first five minutes people showed up and they're like, why am I here? Like, what am I doing at this weird thing where I've never, like, I'm going to talk about something that I've never talked about openly with a bunch of strangers and, you know, cut to like three, four hours later when we're trying to kick everybody out. But like, you know, somebody wants to tell that one other story um, about this really embarrassing moment that, you know, they couldn't imagine anybody else having gone through, but, you know, three other people in the room is like, they're like, of course I've gone through that same thing. And, you know, that being able to be that conduit to connection um, and being able to say like, these are topics that we should be talking about. We shouldn't feel embarrassed. Like we shouldn't feel like we have to shove a tampon up our sleeve when we walk to the, you know, to the bathroom in, in an office. And, you know, when 50% of the people there are probably either on their period at that moment or get their period more generally. And, you know, how can we start to break some of these barriers? I think it does start at home. It starts with an open conversation. It starts with not just, you know, a mother having a, do- a conversation with her daughter, but, you know, including her son or having her, having the, um, the father figure there. Right. So like, really making sure that it, it does continue to grow um, and remain kind of um, more as, as inclusive as we possibly can be, uh, because that's the only way we'll actually kind of chip away at some of the stigma that does exist in these categories. A hundred percent. Yeah, I know I, I'm looking at the Q&A and so I want to encourage anybody that if you guys have questions, definitely, you know, feel free to jump in them. I see one though that's asking about how men can be uh, more supportive in general periods. And I, and I can't speak for you, but I, I would say that first and foremost, it's about not weaponizing your period, you know, and it's about understanding that there's a culture where there has to be an open discussion as Jordana just spoke about in terms of educating, not just our daughters, but our sons um, and reprogramming in some cases, you know, generations of men to, that there is no shame in taking care of your body as a woman. You know, this is a reality that's, you know, every month part of our lives. And so, you know, I think that, 
um, where you know historical brands have have definitely been made available to the female consumer. What Lola's done, which has been to to normalize the experience for young women, and you know, it, it's now going to carry through and beyond period care, but into sexual wellness. You know, we've seen a huge up. Um, I say surge in in companies that are launching and in platforms in the sexual wellness space. And, you know, we spoke to Jordana and said, you guys have an amazing platform already. You know, we're excited to see you continue to get behind that as an extension of period care, you know, just because there is so much opportunity in also having conversations about, you know, sexual education for young women, right? And, and that, you know, this isn't something that people, women should be, you know, ashamed about, you know, protecting themselves. And so I'd love to hear a little bit also your perception of how the you know, your brand is extending out you know, beyond period care and you know, kind of how you see advocacy across the board in terms of all the various, you know, sort of experiences that a woman can have. Yeah, I, mean, I think the, the, again, the, the real insight that we tapped into was that, you know, we were all going through individual these journeys when um, there's so much power um, and so much positivity and potential for change if you're talking about these things openly and and inviting new folks in for their perspective and that's how you get to innovation that's how you get to improvement um, you know that's how you get to to policy change institutional change um, you know and I think sex is a I mean periods I think is um, uh, you know it's definitely um, you know, we want to invite kind of everybody into the conversation. Sex is generally already kind of where there's, there are more folks in the conversation. And when we, uh, when we decided we wanted to continue to ex- expand and extend um, the brand into, you know, building for this reproductive uh, journey from what we say from her first period to her last hot flash and beyond, um, you know, sex is really that category where you're not, you're not just talking to one person, you're talking to more than one person and um you know from a from a packaging perspective from a information and content perspective um from even a kind of overall umbrella branding perspective it was really that moment when we said um we have to change we have to grow up we have to change a little bit of the way that we've been talking about these topics um even the the palette um, should become a little more mature in terms of um, in terms of how we want to present ourselves to the world because we're no longer talking to um, you know just a subset of people who get their periods but actually you know we're talking to the whole population and we want to be a brand that you know is not just um, you know a sexual wellness brand for women but also for men um, and so that was really an exciting moment for us and I think particularly too with content. Um, you know, there's, there's so much, um, there's misinformation out there. There's not a lot of kind of, um, empowerment toward women. Um, there's, there's just a lot of, um, assumptions. I think that is particularly young people have around sexual wellness, kind of intimate wellness. And so, um, you know, we see it as an amazing opportunity to start to change that tone of the conversation, um, Again, but like through very similar tactics that we've all that we've always employed, which is you know inviting that conversation, inviting questions that you may have um, about you know about sex and um, and making it you know a totally non judgmental um, supportive atmosphere, um, and only then when you are kind of really opening up and um, and listening to sort of anybody who's coming into the room, um, can you actually start to change the way that people may think about these categories um, and approach conversations with their partners as well? I mean, and this, you know, it's, this was a, a pretty interesting uh, week that you and I were texting about a big policy change overseas in terms of uh, period care and women's health. You want to maybe sh- when we talk about sort of policy as part of the salt community, it's, it would be an interesting thing to kind of maybe raise awareness about here if people hadn't seen the news. Yeah, I mean, um, Scotland just became for, for those not up to date on their period news. Um, Scotland. <laughs> 
became the first country to make period products free um, for all, particularly for, for people who, who can't afford them, which is such a promising step forward for menstrual equity and a practice we really do hope to see adopted more widely. Um, you know, fighting for menstrual equity, increasing access to period products are issues that are at the center of our mission um, and are so critical to, list, to lifting that very detrimental stigma against women's health that still exists in this country. I mean, we've been very fortunate to work with um, a number of amazing nonprofits. Um, one of our kind of longest standing partnerships has been with a, uh, an organization called I Support the Girls, which um, you know has seen a enormous sur- enormous surge in requests for period products um, starting in March of this year. I mean, with with many homeless shelters, with many um, you know uh, uh, domestic violence sh- shelters, um, tampons, pads, bras are often the most requested items, but the least often donated. And so um, back in 2016, when we launched our Lola Gives Back program, um, you know, we were very lucky and fortunate to partner with I Support the Girls and have expanded our um, our charitable partnerships over time um, um, and have been able to donate, you know, upwards of five, six million tampons, period products um, to women in need across the country. So um, the Scotland news has been incredible. I think, again, it's it for us, it's it really starts with let's change the conversation. Let's open it up. Um, let's, you know, and even myself, right? Like I hadn't even thought about, um, the fact that these products may be, um, in desperate need right here at home. Um, so, you know, really again, raising awareness to the ingredients that you're putting in your body. The fact that, you know, for many of us, it's a sad, it's a sad privilege that we have, that we can afford these products every single month. What can we do? about it. And so, um, you know, again, just continuing to, to engage and, um, and raise these issues, raise these opportunities. Um, because, you know, at least for myself, and I know for so many of our customers, when they're made aware of, of things like, um, that you can't buy tampons with food stamps, they want to help. Um, so I know that we only have a couple more minutes. And so I think we should kind of think through some parting thoughts. You know, I'd say that on our side, um, it's it's going to be kind of for our founders when we talk to them a lot about you know kind of navigating COVID. There was a couple different areas of the frame, right? There was the first sort of immediate response of reforecasting your plan, resetting your marketing, you know, uh, strategies, you know, resetting your team, thinking through financially how you're going to come out the other side stable and sound. You know, entering into 2021, that's evolved because what we've all learned through this period is that it's going to take a lot longer than we thought. And so, you know, we've all been thinking, you know, as an industry creatively about how we're marketing, how is marketing going to change, right? And, and how are we going to market to people now from their, their couches is what we've been saying for the past couple of months, you know, and how, how will you continue to foster this community when people leave their couches again, and then they get out. And so... So as we go into sort of a new, a new climate um, for 2021, and we have more profitable companies that have learned to navigate marketing, you know, very different. We've seen, you know, adoption of our conventional or mass retailers to really, you know, sort of think through wellness, you know, more broadly and to embrace it through the pandemic. You know, on the other side of this, where will we be? And so for 2021, not predicting kind of when things end and you know, the impact of that, you know, if you could answer for me, where do you want to see Lola at the end of next year? You know, what would be an amazing marker of, you know, sort of not just kind of getting through this, but, you know, kind of how Lola has ascended as an omni brand and gone into retail successfully and built out their community? What would be, you know, sort of the goalpost there? It's a great question. Um, I would say that um, a, a few a few things. I think first, from like a business and brand perspective, you know, just continuing to um, invest and build in the areas in which we know are um, have the have the most staying power. So whether that's 
you know, brand building, whether that's community building, whether that's retail expansion, um, whether that's continuing to hone um, and refine our D2C channel and building out more digital products, whether that's, you know, um, you know, things that are more virtual or, um, or different ways that, you know, we can support customers to um, feel very supported by our products, um, uh, you know, as they go through their reproductive uh, journeys. Um, I would say, you know, ensuring that our team feels supported. I think, um, you know, yes, my, my hope, right, all of our hopes that next year at some point there is going to be, um, you know, a moment when we can go back to the office or go back to be working in person and sort of what does that look like? How do we ensure that, you know, we're building an environment where, um, you know, we're, we're taking into account the last let's call it 12 to 16 months, um, you know, where, where things have really changed. People have, people have moved, um, you know, uh, things have changed at home, right? So how do we ensure that we're sort of listening to our team and, and building the right infrastructure um, around like operationally um, where it's going to work for people who want to come back to the office um, versus people who are, you know, who sort of have, have made life changes and, and, um, and, but still, you know, care very much and want to work at the company and, and feel very passionate about the mission still. So, um, you know, and, and again, like our best, our biggest asset, best asset is our people. Um, you know, we feel really so proud of the team that we've built over the last five years. And, um, and this year has been incredibly challenging. Um, and certainly, um, you know, nothing that anybody of us, any of us could have seen coming. Um, and how do you ensure that you're, you're building, um, you're building an environment where, you know, you still can, can maintain um, through all of this different change um, and transitional moments, um, an environment where people, you know, are still kind of um, feeling really inspired and motivated on a day to day basis. Um, so, you know, a lot of a lot of kind of growth from a business perspective. Um, uh, you know, bottom line health, as well as um, really making sure that, uh, you know, the team is, is feeling like every day they're waking up and they're really excited to show up for the company. Uh, well, we're very excited to be part of the journey. So um, I'm trying to think of if there's anything we didn't cover on. We, 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 it's funny, we said during this that there were sort of topics and I feel like we, we had an opportunity to, to cover most of them. You know, I'd say from our perspective, you know, obviously it's going to see you guys continue to succeed, um, you know, building your community, building brand awareness, building your distribution, but also launching innovative products that really meet a need in the market. And so, you know, we've seen a lot of commitment from Walmart through this, which has been amazing. Um, and it's exciting to see them commit, you know, again to now the sexual wellness platform. But, you know, I think what our, our hope for you is to con continue to see sort of the work you and the building blocks you've put in place during this period. Right. Because I feel like if you were able to navigate a launch like this, you know, and, and during this time, I, I, I suspect next year will feel like a breeze. I mean, that's the hope. Right. And I do want to say really too that, I mean, Jordan, it's been such a pleasure partnering with you. I mean, I think, um, you know, it's obviously been a very challenging year um, on so many fronts for so many businesses and, you know, to, to have um, the network sort of being opened up to us, the, you know, the, um, uh, the connecting with the other portfolio brands, um, you know, having just kind of those very spur of the moment calls on how can I help? I mean, that's really where um, it's not in the good times, obviously, when things are, um, when, when you really want to base a relationship on, it's really about kind of the challenging times. And I would say, um, you know, it's, we've just been so lucky to, you know, obviously have an existing investor base that's very supportive, but also now working even close, more closely with you and the AF team. Um, you know, that's like, this is this moment too, where, um, you know, companies who are looking for, you know, active investors um, who, who say they want to support, right, and say they have value-add platforms, um, you know, it really did come to life, um, you know, working with the AF team this year, and, and I know it'll be, continue to be a really fruitful relationship, so um, just really grateful for the partnership. Thank you. Thank you, and, and you made our, our pilot investment into personal care easy. 
<laughs> so as you know, we were we were uh, excited about the transition, but you know, I think our conviction around you guys made it feel like an easy adjustment. So thank you for that. We've loved working with you guys. So with that, no kids interrupted us, no dogs. We made it. <laughs> Well, that was fantastic. Thank you both for joining us. You know, I come from a place of ignorance. I'm one of four brothers. And, you know, probably when I started dating and all that stuff, I probably thought you got tampons at Lululemon, but I've become a little bit more educated now. Um, I have a four, four-year-old daughter and I'm thankful that, that we have women like uh, Jordan and Jordana in the world that will help her along with her mother through, through the journey uh, of health throughout her entire life. So, Thank you guys for doing this. And we're very proud to host conversations like this on the SALT platform. Thank you for having us. Thanks, John.